So, um, like Marcel said, my name is uh, Karsten. Um, this is a project uh, by me and a colleague of mine, uh, Beata Nyari. And uh, we based it on some work from uh, previous colleagues as well. Um, and there's a paper here which uh, describes um, most of the work, like there's some new stuff that I'll be presenting, but most of that uh, is linked in that paper. Um, so the slide will be available afterwards uh, if you want to look that up. Um, all right, so what we're going to talk about is uh, Siamese LSTM and how to implement it in Keras. And what we're doing with those is uh, learning a character-based face representation. Um, so let's start with why we want to learn such a face representation. Um, I work for a company called TextKernel, where we're based in Amsterdam. Um, part of what we do is uh, we do analysis on the job market. And part of that is that we process like uh, millions of vacancies and um, we extract the job titles. So here on the left, um, this is the smallest text on the slides, by the way. So if you can't read this in the back, uh, at least the rest will be readable. Um, but this is a vacancy for an NLP machine learning research engineer. Um, and we extract this title and then uh, you have this extracted string. But if you want to do analytics, um, just this string is not very uh, usable because you want to uh, count how many people are a uh, machine learning researcher. Then you need to know that this is also a machine learning researcher. So part of what we have is this profession taxonomy which is like an ontology about the different types of professions that exist and which of those are actually the same job. So for example, here you see that a machine learning engineer and a deep learning engineer and a machine learning consultant are all the same profession according to our ontology. So um, this is like a modeling choice. How do you uh, divide up the job market? Um, but given this choices that we made, this ontology, this taxonomy that we have, um, we have this problem of how do we map these things that we extract, these vacancy titles, to um, those groups, those clusters in the taxonomy. Uh, yeah, in this case, it's a mostly manually curated taxonomy, um, which also means that it doesn't have like all the variation that you would see in a, like a mind taxonomy. It only has like some manually added strings, um, which makes the problem of this mapping a bit harder. Um, right, so what this does taxonomy looks like in our case is um, it has more than 5,000 professions and it includes about, uh, I think, 24, 25,000 job titles. It changes because people are curating it. Um, and when we explain this problem to people, it often sounds a lot like, oh, that's a classification problem, right? You want to classify which profession this is. However, um, with 5,000 different professions, um, it's very hard to build a classifier for that. So we take a different approach. Um, also, these professions, they partly overlap often. Um, so, what do we do? Instead of um, building this classifier, what we want to do is want, we want to learn the similarity between these job uh, phrases so that given those job titles that we do have, we can map all the variation of job titles that we find in extracted documents uh, to the most similar um, job titles in this taxonomy. Um, so we basically want to learn a space in which um, this uh, distance between these job titles is large if they are from different professions and smaller from uh, the same profession. And if you can read this, there's an example PR manager and HR manager. And if you would learn um, like string similarity, those would be very close together because they're almost the same string, one letter difference. Um, but in reality, they're very different jobs. Um, so we have a baseline system which did this, which is based on uh, string similarity with a lot of hacks to deal with this kind of issues. But what I want to do now is learn a uh, representation, a vector representation of these job titles, such that the space is behaved in this way, that the job titles group together quite nicely. 
And then you don't have this problem with like partially overlapping jobs in those 5,000 classes, because then it's okay if you map it to one or the other as long as they're like grouped in the space. All right, so um, that's the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, I'll explain a bit like what the model is, the Siamese BLCM model, and then we'll go to like how we implemented that in uh, Keras. All right, so this uh, Siamese BLCM model, what we're actually trying to learn is a character level encoder. So it's a, um, it's a recurrent neural network um, over the characters in a string. And um, in the end, we want to end up with a representation that has these um, that has these it's like semantic uh, similarity that we're looking for. Um, so this um, um, this RNN model will output at the end some vector, and um, the space of those vectors should be like the space that I showed. All right, so um, who here knows what the LSTM is? All right, who here does not know what the LSTM is? All right, so I would say um, most people, but not everyone. Um, so this encoder, uh, this encoder model, let me look on here, that's easier. Um, what it does is um, basically it's a like multi-layer neural network. Um, it's a recurrent neural, uh, neural network over the characters, but first there's a character embedding. Um, so, um, yeah, maybe I shouldn't go too much in detail to this. Um, the main part is this BLSCM layer that you'll see in the middle, um, which is a recurrent neural network which goes over all the characters. And it goes two ways. So the BL BLSTM in uh, the title is a uh, bidirectional LSTM. And in the end, you get um, like a vector for each character. And then um, you calculate the actual representation of the entire string by averaging over all those characters in this case, and then uh, doing another linear uh, transformation of that. Um, I think for this um, for this presentation, um, you don't need to entirely understand that. Um, we'll mostly be looking at like this, where we have this encoder, and we're just going to show like how do you train this as a Siamese network. Um, all right, but first, like why did we choose to make like a character level uh, representation? Um, well, we have to deal with a lot of uh, spelling and unknown words. This taxonomy that we're training on is quite small compared to variation in actual data. Um, and we also want to work in like uh, a lot of different languages. So we have to deal with like different types of morphology, compound nouns. Uh, so those are words which are multiple nouns stuck together, like you have in uh, Dutch. Um, and job titles are relatively short sequences anyway. Um, which means that it's uh, that a character level model is quite applicable to this. All right, so we have this uh, network, right? I mean, we get this representation out, but how do we train it? How do you get uh, a gradient to train on? Uh, what kind of loss can you um, define on this representation? Um, In this case, um, we decide to do that as a, a Siamese network. Um, so what you see here is um, the encoder that um, we defined previously. And there's basically two copies of that encoder. Um, so they both share the weights. Um, they're the same model, and that is the model in the end that we are interested in because that defines, that outputs those factors that are phase representations. Um, but how do we want to train that? Um, so the idea behind the Siamese model is that um, we take those representations on pairs of strings, and um, then we put another layer on top, which actually isn't like a real layer, it's just calculating the cosine distance. Um, 
So then we know that if we minimize that cosine distance for strings which should be close together, uh, then this representation gets this uh, uh, training signal to uh, make the space in such a way that uh, similar strings are close together. Um, same thing for if we sample uh, negative examples. Like here you see a, a Java programmer is not the same as a text driver. Um, so if you know that this pair is like a negative sample, um, then you can maximize this cosine distance. Um, and in our case, how do we get this training data? Well, I, I show you this taxonomy, right? Um, so you can just start generating pairs out of that taxonomy. Um, and that way you get uh, quite a bit of training data because like 20,000 points is not that much, but all possible pairs between those, that's already a lot more. Um, right. Right, so the question is, um, given those training pairs, um, like what is the ground truth label, right? Yeah. Um, in this case, it's just uh, zero if they're uh, the same uh, pair from the same class. So just make it as small as possible. And it's one if it's from different class. Um, so then it's just like put them f as far away as possible. But there's like a small implementation detail there that we take a margin in the loss function that we say um, if you're already far enough away, then uh, you don't get any gradient on that. Um, right, so how do you implement this in Keras, which is this Python uh, deep learning library? Um, well, first of all, why did we pick Keras? Um, it's like a high level. Uh, library, so you can uh, make prototypes in it quite quickly, especially for these kind of problems, because it has all these kind of layers like LSTM, RNN, it's all predefined. Um, it has predefined optimized and stuff. It's like uh, TensorFlow, uh, like a nice layer on top of TensorFlow. Um, or a team like Python, well, that's preference. I think it's shared here. Um, this. Uh, <laughs> Keras has this nice API, and uh, it, at the time it had like a relatively big community compared to the other ones. Um, currently we're a bit behind already because there's a new version of Keras, but if you want to run these examples, um, use this version 1.1.1. Uh, All right, so first thing, right? Um, we have those two encoders, they get some input. That input is the characters in uh, those input strings, um, which are represented by some integer. Um, so what you see here is um, this input class, which defines an uh, um, input layer. And the nice thing about Keras is here you see the shape is just input length. We don't have to bother with defining like what is our batch size. Um, so it's quite a, a concise representation of this. Um, and you, you see you defined that the type is an integer. Um, like default, all the other layers will just be floats. Um, but the first thing that we'll do is have these characters represented as integers and then look up their embeddings. Um, yes, yeah, so like I said, um, each of those characters um, so the output here, this character is a tensor um, of shape, batch size, which we haven't defined yet by input length. Um, now, we have to define this encoder model. Um, in this case, uh, it didn't fit in the presentation to go directly, entirely into how we uh, program that. So I just abstracted it away. This encoder is just something you can give that tensor um, like these inputs, and you get this output tensor, these representations. Um, so this is the encoder that we want to train in the end. So here you see the two branches of the Siamese network, uh, representation one and representation two, the left and the right branch, um, which is the encoding of the characters. So in these five lines of code, what we basically 
um, created is this part of the network already, the two branches, um, but they're not connected together. Um, and again, the shape of those output tensors is then the batch size, which we didn't define uh, by the representation dimensionality, uh, which is a parameter on your encoder. Um, now the trick which basically makes this into a Siamese network which you can uh, train is by um, just combining those two output layers uh, using a cosine function. And then if you uh, take the error on the cosine function, you can just back propagate to all the previous layers, including the encoder itself, which is also a network. Uh, all right, so that's... Um, that basically defines the whole Siamese network. Um, and then the output shape will just be the batch size by one because the cosine distance is just a single scalar. Um, so what you feed this is these uh, pairs of uh, strings and this ground truth uh, distance. Um, right, and then uh, Keras has this model class which is nicely packages this. Um, it's a container class for um, basically a uh, uh, computation graph and um, you can ask Keras to now compile this graph for you with your chosen backend. Uh, we use Tiano and in future we'll probably be moving to TensorFlow. Um, and the loss here is mean squared error because um, this sort of uh, glosses over what I was saying before with the margin. Um, here we just take the loss between the uh, actual distance, the distance should be big or small, and uh, the predicted distance, and then we just average that over the batch. Um, then the Siamese generator is something which will generate these uh, training data and these ground to distance for you, and um, you fit on the generator. All right. So that basically concludes like how to implement this in Keras. So uh, with these slides, you should be able to implement your own Siamese network. Um, so any questions on that that are like short, like uh, <laughs> no understand? No? Okay. Cool. Then we're going to get into how do we actually uh, get this to work. Um, because it turns out if you just feed it these pairs of strings from the code table, um, that, yeah, you don't get a very robust network. And um, to be fair, I think this is also the part where we ended up spending most of our time and most of our effort. Um, these libraries like Keras make it very easy to implement something like this and to train it and uh, to run it, but um, in the end, it's all about like how you choose to train it and what kind of um, data you choose to model, especially if you're training on like this sort of generated data. All right, so what do we actually want this model to, um, to be able to deal with? Um, so if you have these extracted titles and these like handmade, uh, nice, clean titles, um, we wanted to be able to deal with spelling variation and typo, like a coordinator with or without a dash. Um, that's not very, uh, that doesn't have any semantic meaning, but it looks like a different token. So that's one of the reasons why you took a character based uh, approach. Um, another thing is synonyms and abbreviations. You wanted to be able to learn that a software developer is the same as a programmer. Um, in the software domain, but uh, a housing developer is not the same as a housing programmer, for example. Um, or HR is the same as human resources in most cases. Um, and because we extract these fakesy titles, uh, there will be a lot of noise. Uh, an extracted title looks like experienced Java developer in London making a lot of books an hour. Um, while these uh, job titles that we're trying to uh, measure the similarity to are these clean job titles, Java developer, for example. Um, so one way of dealing with this is uh, data augmentation, um, which is the nice uh, thing you get from making this end-to-end -end model that you can start messing with this data easily to sort of model, um, uh, model the kind of behaviors that you want. So in order to deal with noise, we um, 
to deal with typos, we just add random noise to strings and train on that. Um, to deal with these uh, synonyms, we um, mine a synonym dictionary from this code table and then apply that to other cases. So, for example, if you have a manually created set, you might have a C programmer but not C developer, but you will have Java programmer and Java developer. And uh, you can just start substituting these in and it will be noisy. Um, but in general, uh, most of them will be okay. Um, or you won't uh, uh, find them in real data. Uh, and the other thing is that we had this previous baseline method based on string distance. Um, and we have a lot of these vacancies. We process, uh, yeah, I don't know exactly how much, but millions per year. Um, so we can take the ones where that model is very certain and also use those as training data. And this has actually turned out to be very important because um, um, this data that we generate from this code table was not very close to how these actual strings look, right? These, these uh, uh, Java developer in London, that kind of noise. Um, so you want to train it to be uh, robust to that noise by finding examples that look more like real data. Um, the other problem is that if you just sample strings from these known strings in this way, uh, and you just sample randomly without any bias, um, it will be very unlikely that you sample a negative pair which is close enough to give you a good hint about how to change your model to train. So the gradient will be um, very low if this negative pair is already far away. Um, so what you get is if I have this input string head of facilities at EA, then um, the neighborhood of that string will contain um, head cleaning and head of cleaning as well as facilities manager because um, it never really samples these um, these things which are very close in the space already because it starts by learning this uh, this uh, uh, string distance um, but it doesn't sample them enough to start pushing them away um, so one option to do that is to just bias this sampling towards your current uh, neighborhood. So while you're training, you can recompute these embeddings of all these examples, and then you can um, uh, sample from those which are close by so that you can get a high gradient if you sample something which should be far away. Um, and you can also bias this for positive samples which should be close by by sampling those which are positive, but are far away in this learned space. For example, um, if you have here this uh, negative neighbors, we have a business economics teacher and without the, uh, without the local sampling, uh, you'll have something like business engineer because there's a string overlap, it will be close by. And now with this uh, neighbor sampling, it, you will have a very high probability of sampling these um, uh, sort of imposter uh, codes. Uh, codes, I mean strings. Um, another thing, horticulturalist and hotel receptionist, uh, like these post fixes, this, this network starts learning these post fixes pretty rapidly. Um, and that might confuse it as well, but then if you sample again from this local neighborhood space, you can uh, train it to move away from these uh, pathological kind of behaviors. Um, and you can also sample positive neighbors so that you can make sure that um, if you just sample negative neighbors, uh, you might just start increasing the space because um, uh, you're sampling in such a way that you're saying like, oh, oh these things should be far away. Um, but you also want to uh, put in some uh, constraints about which things should, should they keep close so that it like uh, goes in the uh, correct direction. Mm. Right, so um, given this uh, Siamese training and this data augmentation, um, how do we get results and how do we actually measure these results? Um, so one way of measuring is just you take some prediction set and you take some uh, thousand jobs and you uh, start labeling if the correct code, the correct profession was predicted or not. And uh, what you see here on the left are three different models 
or a baseline model, which was already quite good, and then our Siamese baseline, which was the model that we sort of presented here, and then this Siamese baseline plus this neighbor sampling. Um, I see that um, the Siamese baseline already um, improves over this uh, baseline model, um, and then adding neighbor sampling, we get like quite a nice improvement. Um, however, we also still want to know like those, those uh, behaviors that we said that we want to model, those invariance to noise, the invariance to typos, uh, synonyms. Um, how do you measure this? Well, a good way that we found for uh, measuring this kind of behavior is by sort of making machine le learning unit tests. Um, so basically you just create specific data sets uh, with um, uh, these things where you know that these models show this behavior. Or for example, for the typo, you just uh, uh, make a data set with strings um, which are actually the same string but have a typo, and then you measure how well it does not that. Uh, so that's a very cheap way to start if you know some of these pathological modes or some of these behaviors that you want to model. Uh, it's a very cheap way of starting to dig into that and uh, to debug your model that way. Um, so those are the three um, columns on the left. The typo uh, are those types. Composition is synonymy. Um, does it learn to uh, recognize synonyms? And the X of words is this invariance to all this noise in this extracted data. And what we see is that this uh, trigrams baseline, which is basically a variant of string distance, is very good with the typos. Um, but it doesn't learn about synonyms because it can't learn that developer and programmer are, are the same thing. Um, and our Siamese model, uh, especially with the neighbor sampling, uh, starts to really pick up on these uh, synonyms. Now, um, on this extra words noise, um, the baseline was used as uh, uh, a model to select these extra words examples. So um, we couldn't measure that uh, because that would be uh, like perfect score always. Um, but we can distinguish now between different versions of a model, which was very important when developing this model and like deciding uh, where should you focus your R&D effort next. Um, some examples of that. Um, on the top is what does this model learn to do better than the baseline? Is this readable from the back? Yeah, sort of. I see. I see some hands going like this. Um, so, if we have a front office executive as a string, um, the string distance method will pick up something like finance executive, uh, while this encoder model will uh, find that um, coordinator is basically the same as uh, executive and front office coordinator is actually a lot closer to front office executive than uh, finance executive. Um, same for the clinical administration system. Again, uh, a lot of string overlap, um, but here this model learns that medical and clinical are very related, even though it's just on a character level. So we are quite happy with that kind of results. Um, on the other hand, uh, some stuff like estate AG branch manager, um, you still see some of this pathological behavior, um, which also has a lot of to do with like which data do you feed it. Um, my intuition is how more real data you have, how uh, less of this kind of errors you'll see. All right, so to conclude, um, we can learn an encoder model that encodes semantics of job titles better than this uh, trigram distance, even if you try very hard to manually create all these different job titles. Um, and we can train it as a Siamese model, so you can, uh, you only have to give it, is it far or close, this pair, instead of having to like, give some ground truth for the web station or give like, a lot of data to learn an embedding. Um, and careful sampling of this data uh, to train it really improves performance as well as digging into like these different uh, error types that you see. Um, right. So uh, we are text kernel, we are hiring as well. <laughs> uh,